Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, don't worry, the tail numbers are available commercially uh, on a real-time basis, so uh, you don't have to worry about the government there looking at you, Don. Um, I just want to return to the, the uh, question. I understand that we want to promote this industry, and we do. Uh, you know, this is great for the U.S. to maintain our leadership in space. But the question is, why would we have the same agency promote and oversee safety? Uh, why wouldn't it be the Commerce Department or some other part of the government that would do that? Uh, again, I mean, no offense, uh, Dr. Neal, but I, I heard exactly those same things a couple of months before ValueJet when my amendment was defeated, and then uh, uh, my colleague said, oops, that doesn't look too good, does it? Uh, and so there's, you know, why wouldn't it be appropriate to have another agency of the federal government, more appropriate, like Commerce, uh, promote? Thank you for that question. I think an important part of that is exactly what do we mean by the terminology. And so let me explain how we interpret that, that phrase, encourage, facilitate, and promote, by saying what it's not. It, it is not favoring one company over another. It is not cutting corners. It is not compromising when we come to public safety. In fact, we do have that perfect safety record with 290. Yeah, but the qualification offices. being no member of the public has been killed. Which is the and job there is, that Congress there are some criticisms in the NTSB regarding the process that went forward, you know, the construction of the vehicle before, you know, there was any review uh, by FAA asked, and the whole human factors uh, interaction issue that was, and, and it, they do say, uh, however, some FAS technical staff members reported their questions did not directly relate to public safety, were filtered by FAA ask management to reduce the burden on scale. Well, unfortunately, someone died. Uh, so, you know, that leads me exactly to the point I'm making. That pressure was exerted, and they complied because of your promotional mandate. Uh, let me, Dr. Dillingham, do you, do you have anything to comment on this? Is there another agency of government that could do the promotion and they could just focus on, and maybe they wouldn't have to hire a bunch more people if they just focused on that uh, part? Uh, thank you, Mr. DeFazio. Um, in one of our earlier reports, we made, we made that exact point that there, there is either inherent or potential conflict with the dual mandate of promotion and, and safety oversight. We also made the, the recommendation that um, FAA work with the Department of Commerce to come up with a memorandum of understanding that would in fact delineate um, which of the agencies would be uh, responsible for what part of promotion in line with their statutory, um, their, their statutory um, uh, situation as well as their mission. So it, bottom line, we still think that that is something that needs to be looked at. It's, it's hard to, to know where that line, where that line co is drawn, but the more the industry expands with all the different kinds of vehicles and technologies, it is, becoming, uh, it is still a risk and will become even more of a risk. Okay, thank you. Um, now, back to this, uh, the insurance. I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit. Uh, when did FAA set the um, $500 million cap on acquired insurance? Yep. Sorry. Whoever... Uh, in the mid '80s, I think. Okay, and and they also have this. Not then, where you have the federal government indemnification, which back then I think was estimated to be uh, 1.5 billion. But now we're adjusting that part for inflation and saying the potential government uh, indemnification, subject to appropriation, might be a problem there. Uh, is 3.06 billion, but we haven't talked about the 500 million and indexing that to inflation. So why are we indexing the government, the taxpayers' liability to inflation, but not the um, you know the the required acquisition of insurance? I think Dr. Dr. Neal. Yeah. My understanding is both of those numbers are inflation adjusted. I could be not correct on that, but. It, it, uh, I don't know. My understanding is I, I, the documents I have uh, say from the GAO. Now I'd be happy to be uh, that it was set at 500, and that hasn't been indexed. Congressman, if I could just comment, I yeah. think 
the reason that we really don't know the answer to that question is because that number practically has never been approached. It's actually set by the NPL with a cap of $500 million, and if the maximum probable loss is calculated to be less than that, then the question has never been asked, and as I understand it, that's been the case. Okay. So, I mean, wouldn't this vary per operation depending upon you're launching out of a heavily populated area, you're launching in a very remote area, uh, you know, the trajectory that you're going to use, et cetera, wouldn't, I mean, shouldn't it vary on each, uh, on each yes, one? Yes, it should, and it does. So we, we calculated a separate maximum probable loss for each vehicle, each location, and right. as long as it is less than that cap, of $500 million, then that is the number in terms of how much insurance needs to be purchased. Okay, but if someone were doing something that you thought was going to exceed $500 million, you would just say, well, you buy 500 and the government will take care of the rest? That's the general principle, although I think it's important to recognize that it's a conditional payment of excess third-party claims. So it is not a guarantee, and Congress would need to be persuaded that that was the appropriate thing to do to reimburse the third parties that have suffered under that condition. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Duncan, uh, 